Good afternoon. Thank you all for tuning in to our Bulldogs Behind the Scenes webinar featuring the Great Lakes Aquarium. Well, my name is Molly Nelson and I'm part of the UMD Alumni Relations team. Also on this webinar are my colleagues Matt Duffy and Austin Sommerfeld. Today's webinar is hosted by Zoom. Before I introduce our guests, I'd like to note that on the bottom of the screen, there's a place for you to ask questions titled Q&A. During the presentation, feel free at any time to type your question in and Sarah or Jay will try to answer as many of them at the end of the session. This webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to our alumni website with a link to YouTube. Once the video is ready, we will send a link directly to you. So today we have the pleasure of hearing from Jay Walker, the Executive Director of the Great Lakes Aquarium, and Sarah Erickson, the Deputy Director of Programs and Development. Jay is originally from Kensington, Minnesota, and has lived in Duluth since 1999. One of the original aquarium staff that opened the building in 2000, Jay has been the Director of Operations, Assistant Director, and Executive Director. He holds a degree in aquaculture from Alexandria Technical College, and a degree in fisheries from the University of Wisconsin-Superior. He has opened two public aquariums, which included the development of exhibits, collection of animals, obtaining permits, startup of systems, hiring staff and developing policies and programs. Mr. Walker has been involved with the design, development and construction of 10 rotating exhibits. Sarah is originally from New Hampshire and has lived in Duluth since 2005. She has a background in biology from Smith College and a master's degree in environmental education from UMD. She has practiced as an educator in formal and non-formal settings in Duluth and across the country. Sarah began at the aquarium in 2005 as a graduate student leading outreach for the Minnesota DNR. Since 2008, Sarah has led the learning and engagement department at Great Lakes Aquarium. Her work has included curriculum and exhibit design instruction, interpretation, outreach, writing, research, social media and communications, staff management, organizational planning, grant writing, and development. It is now my pleasure to welcome Jay and Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. We're delighted to be here. So today we are going to give you a glimpse into the history and the current status and the future of the aquarium. Um, we're going to take you on a virtual tour. Uh, so we're going to take you behind the scenes. We're going to meet some animal residents and hear from staff. And uh, the goal is to give you really a sense of the complex and exciting and challenging nature of operating Great Lakes Aquarium. Um, we're going to touch on some of the unique challenges presented by COVID-19 as well. Um, so to start kind of big picture, the aquarium is a nonprofit organization. Um, our mission is to connect all people to the water and wildlife of Lake Superior and beyond. And we really are a mission driven organization rooted in our community. Um, there are another number of other organizations that do similar work um, around education, recreation, wildlife, um, but we're unique in that we operate out of this 62,000 square foot aquarium space with exhibits and animal collection and public gathering space. Um, we leverage these unique resources to support our mission in constantly evolving ways. We are um, always reimagining and um, redeveloping to meet community need. Uh, the aquarium is the number one paid visitor attraction in Duluth, and but it's more than just a building and more than a tourist attraction. It's a gathering place for celebrations and meetings, a place for people to make memories together. Uh, it's an extension of classrooms for school communities and a space that really encourages discovery and skill building. Um, when the aquarium was first envisioned, the goal was for the space and the programming to engage the community with freshwater education on the shores of Lake Superior. Um, before we dig into the the history of the aquarium, though, you'll hear from Jay about some of the history in a moment. Um, we wanted to give you a sense of kind of what we're about and a glimpse at the work we do. So to do that, to kind of start us off, we wanted to share with you our most recent commercial edit um, featuring our new branding and tagline, Discover Wonder.
unfortunately, we finished this commercial edit just before the pandemic forced us to close to the public in mid-March. Um, today, actually, is the first day the aquarium's open to the public again, and the experience is going to look a little different for a while. A few notable changes are that the touch pools won't be open for the foreseeable future, and we won't be gathering people in large groups in sort of that intimate way that um, we're used to doing our work. Uh, but we are excited to be open and to delve into the history. I'm going to hand over to Jake. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, one thing I, I want to make a note on that commercial, I may be biased, but that's a catchy little tune. Um, so to give you some perspective of where we are in, uh, it is our 20th year. And um, uh, if we go uh, way back for the, the history here, the, the land the aquarium sits on is part of the St. Louis River estuary which is the largest tributary on, on Lake Superior. The aquarium is located on the land of indigenous people, including the Ojibwe, Dakota, and Northern Cheyenne. This land was ceded by the Ojibwe to the United States government as part of the Treaty of 1854. The land was later purchased by the Marshall family of Duluth and transferred to the state of Minnesota for the purpose of building a freshwater education facility. Officially, Lake Superior Center deep doing business as Great Lakes Aquarium is charged by the legislature with carrying out a mission related to freshwater education. As a nonprofit, we are managed by an executive director and 13 member board of directors. And the, uh, we have an authority board that is the state entity that oversees the state's interest. We incorporated in 1989 and started fundraising for and planning for the construction of Lake Superior Center. And you can see it being built here in front of you. Um, in 1995, we did bring on a team of educators to provide outreach and education to schools to, to start uh, working through the mission that we have of, of education with in fresh water. And in 1998, the organization changed its name to Great Lakes Aquarium. And then in July 2000, we opened our doors. Due to inflated attendance and projections and the expenses of running aquarium, we did uh, have some financial struggles that led to layoffs and um, uh, a management change to Ripley's Leisure Entertainment. From 2002 to 2007, Ripley's Leisure Entertainment managed the organization and provided a framework for operating. And during these years, it became clear that the aquarium was a viable concept, but needed broad community support and involvement. Significant improvements were also needed to support a high quality visitor experience. To meet these goals, the aquarium went back to local management in 2007. Since then, we have faced many challenges. We have weathered several flooding events, uh, economic downturns, negative community perception, and lack of resources. Through it all, though, there have been supporters that believed in us and our work, and an amazing team of people that work hard, have fun together, are adaptable, creative, and support each other. The trend in the last 12 years has been positive in, uh, related to revenue, attendance, and community perception. We have increased our visitation, our annual revenue, staffing, and reach within the community. In the past decade, the aquarium has experienced an increased level of financial support from individuals, foundations, government, and other grant ma makers. But the aquarium's, and the, the aquarium's annual budget now is approximately $3.1 million, and our main sources of funding are from admissions, concessions, and parking fees, and the additional uh, funding that we receive from tourism tax revenue, uh, membership, rentals, and then as I mentioned, the donations and grants. Uh, with some of the history behind us, let's go on a tour and learn a bit more about how the aquarium has evolved, uh, the ways we engage with the community, and our future plans. So a quick note, as we have been closed for three months, um, our bare bones staff has been working to keep things going. Uh, some of the videos are from recently, while others are, uh, well, we're, we've been working on getting this space ready for visitors, and some are images from the past year or so. So we just kindly ask you to uh, please ignore some of, some of the mess of in progress. Um, so as we start our tour, you'll enter the aquarium and you are greeted by the famous eel pout in the lobby, uh, the two-story water wall, and our guest services staff. Um, we've removed some of the typical furniture in this space uh, due to the pandemic and are creating a one-way flow to support physical distancing. Um, when you arrive uh, after viewing the harbor and the the lift bridge, you'll arrive at the second floor to start your journey in our origins gallery. Um, these exhibits tell the story of the evolution of life in the Great Lakes Basin over time through geology and biology, uh, from Lake Spear bedrock to early life uh, like Nautilus, which we'll see here in a moment, um, and some live corals. Our plan was to actually update this entire gallery this spring, which would have been opening right about now. Um, that work was paused due to COVID-19, and so we have done some minor updates, um, but we hope to revisit that 
those bigger changes uh, in, in the future. Uh, this space, you're able to see the sort of warehouse structure of our facility, and you can look down across the water table and the two-story exhibit called Isle Royal. Uh, updating exhibits is something that we are consistently focused on and have been for the past decade. Um, since 2008, we've creatively invested over $3 million into the facility. Uh, we've got a lot of community support to do that um, through individual contributions and grants. Uh, and we've also designed some exhibits offsite. Uh, we built a 400 square foot exhibit about Lake Superior and climate change for the Minnesota State Fair. And our teams and exhibits have won awards for design, accessibility, and education. The original exhibits at the aquarium focused on specific habitats around Lake Superior. Many of the animal habitats are models after real places. For example, the Baptism River um, that you just uh, would just kind of pass by there. Um, one of the most recent changes to the exhibit floor was the addition of exhibits like our Virginia possum and the two-striped skunks, which are, we're seeing right now, that have become social media favorites. And why skunks at the aquarium? We get this question along with why birds and, and some of the other non-fish related species. And uh, so when we think of the Lake Superior, we want people to think about the watershed as a whole, including land, water, wildlife, and people. <laughs> That's a cute little guy. Uh, after you work at the aquarium well, you forget that not all, work are, uh, all, not all workplaces are like this, uh, where one of our daily duties that gets bartered around with your colleagues for coverage is walking the skunks every day. Um, they go on these enrichment walks outside where they dig, eat dandelions, and explore the aquarium grounds. It's also completely normal for people to stop working on graphic design or volunteer training projects to go scuba diving in, all, in an exhibit before lunch. The skunks here are a good example of an animal ambassador. The animals in our care engage with guests, provide an opportunity for close observation, asking questions, and dismantling misconceptions. The ability to make observations, ask questions, and change your understanding of the world are key to a healthy community. These uh, foundational skills serve us well in many parts of our lives, not just related to healthy ecosystems and animals. We really see the work we do in fostering empathy, inquiry, and discovery skills as big, important work for all ages. Uh, each year, we reach 175,000 visitors with these opportunities for discovery and learning and connection. About 10,000 of these visitors are uh, program participants through field trips, outreach, camps, camps and classes. And we're committed to, as an organization to working with communities um, and individuals to listen, create, evaluate, and we have a dedicated staff member who focuses on inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. Um, all staff receive an inclusion training as part of their hiring, and we continue to change hiring protocols, language, and policies to improve accessibility, inclusion, and representation in our organization. Uh, in the past year, for instance, we have built a strong relationship with the Lighthouse Center for Vision Loss. Uh, staff and participants from the blind and low vision community have participated in focus groups, offered training, provided technical support, uh, have volunteered with us. And uh, this image you're seeing is uh, some children participating in a tactile tour as part of our shipwrecks exhibit um, on a recent uh, day for visitors with low vision or vision loss. We recently remodeled our St. Louis River exhibits as habitat for more turtle, ducks, and fish species. You can see the turtles and ducks there. Um, the long-term goal of this is, is uh, actually to do a larger story about the St. Louis River um, because of how important that, that story is to our community. And, um, and this, uh, um, just, and uh, we see a perch here, just creating a, um, a larger um, expanse there for that story. As we move into Critter Corner, this is the home to two of the three touch pools that opened in 2018 as part of the Feel Connected campaign. While the majority of our exhibits feature habitats and wildlife from Lake Superior and Great Lakes watersheds, we do feel it's important for people to understand our connection to the world's oceans. The Pacific Ocean Touch Pool and Moon Jelly Touch Pools are popular and effective at engaging people in personal and tactile ways. Unfortunately, these touch pools are closed due to the pandemic. But these spaces have been staffed by an animal encounter ambassador, staff that provides interpretation, support safety for people and animals, and nurtures that personal experience that really makes our experience special. The people in this role are our college, local college students to retired professionals, and many of the ambassadors that we have also interned with our animal care team. So they provide a lot of frontline support to the visitor experience. Um, one year ago, we opened a new exhibit uh, called Raptor Ridge. 
This is a, an indoor, outdoor exhibit, which is kind of a unique um, exhibit, I must say, for these species um, of bald eagle and turkey vulture. Um, the Foundation's Business of Vigils contributed to the $100,000 project. This exhibit features graphics, audio labels, and supports the animals, um, and oh, it supports the animals' needs to weather in the open air, and you can see how it's indoor-outdoor here at this point. Um, this, uh, before we had this display, we would uh, bring the bald eagle, transfer the bald eagle to our back deck for weathering, which is a lot of trips in the elevator. And since being housed in this exhibit for the physical health has improved and he eagerly participates in training and his own care, as you can see our animal, senior animal care tech, Natalie, working uh, with him right there with Bogey. Impressive. And there's his, uh, our turkey vulture horse uh, airing out his feathers. So this, uh, this is our freshwater forest exhibit. It's a popular destination for families and youth. This play space features content for all ages. We encourage safe risk-taking, independence, and literacy with a selection of books focused on nature-based topics. We intentionally curate these books to include diverse representation in characters and authors. This exhibit was developed in a partnership with the U.S. Forest Service and Seaway, uh, Scenic Byways Program. And just down the hall from the forest exhibit is the Discovery Center. It was built in 2015 as a multi-purpose space for classes, gatherings, and events. And we're really leveraging these spaces to reach people and diversify revenue. The following images showcase a few of the programs that engage the community. Our Whirly Gigs preschool program and nature play program Chickadees runs 35 weeks a year. We utilize our classroom and uh, exhibit galleries and our grounds for these programs in all types of weather. From November to March, we also offer a Toddler Tuesday program. And adults can have fun here too. So from weddings and banquets and meetings of all sizes and types, uh, we have spaces both indoors and outdoors uh, to host groups of all size. So we encourage you to think of us for your next, next big event. The Discovery Center uh, space and some of our spaces are adaptable so we can offer uh, programming to small groups. So we offer school year and summer camp programming. Um, we work with youth behind the scenes to participate in animal care. They learn to scuba dive or work with the scientists and regional professionals in the field. Many children in Duluth are growing up now as aquarium kids connected with Lake Superior and wildlife. And we've seen these kids go from our preschool program all the way up to being uh, middle school volunteers. A free teacher resource center contains kits and equipment that we lend out um, to the community and that they've reached over 10,000 youth in this past year. We also offer professional development program called the Science Institute. Uh, our camp and preschool programs, because of the uh, COVID-19, are moving to a blended model this summer. They will not be offered on site. Um, this new program called Summer Camp in a Box and Whirly Gigs Preschool in a Box um, has children registered from all over the country. We have over 20 states represented, and right now um, over 160 kids are registered for that programming. We wanted to show you a snippet of the intro video the campers will receive. It gives you some good glimpses of the exhibit floor, some parts that we aren't able to show you today, and um, shows our staff hard at work in their masks, keeping our community safe.
So uh, we're taking all that fun and packing it into some boxes and doing um, live videos and Zoom calls with campers all over. Um, they will receive this box of materials to follow along with camp. Uh, so we're looking forward to, uh, we're ending week one of our camp program for, for this summer and uh, looking forward to next week. It's an exciting program. Uh, what you see here, we're uh, looking at the river otters. Uh, the river otters are one of our most popular residents at the aquarium. This is Agate and Orr. Um, they were rehomed wildlife from Louisiana. Uh, the aquarium holds several permits that uh, set standards of care for animals like the otters, protected species like the eagle, and native fish species like the sturgeon and sunfish. We, we work closely with animal care staff at other zoos and aquaria. Uh, we worked with the Raptor Center in Twin Cities, and we have, uh, we have a local veterinarian, and we even have a fish vet, which is sort of an interesting thing. Um, our staff conducts routine exams, weighs animals, do blood and fecal work, as well as necropsies if need be on, de on deceased animals. The animal care team is divided into terrestrial and aquatic team with the aquarium uh, furloughed 46 staff in March. These eight staff remained hard at work caring for the aquarium's residents. Um, this uh, person here is one of our volunteers. We have more than 150 volunteers that provide tactile experiences and interpretation about otters to another, um, looks like they're doing that right now, otters to another volunteer guest who is blind. Volunteers support visitors, engage, uh, engagement, dive operations, and classes. Uh, coming up for the aquarium, uh, the Great Lakes uh, water table is one of the quintessential aquarium experiences. Uh, we even sell t-shirts and then if you've, any of you have been here and have children, I'm sure you've walked away soaked, but we have a t-shirt that says I, have, I got soaked at the Great Lakes Aquarium. And for our 20th anniversary, we are planning on opening a whole new water table experience. Um, this, um, hopefully this small, maybe into the spring, which includes a new Great Lakes water table that is more accessible and representative of our community. Water play activities encourage visitors to explore the properties of water in an interactive watersheds at work area showcases how the aquarium and city water treatment facilities mimic natural systems in the river to clean and cool water. We received 150,000 from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, as well as 98,000 from Minnesota Lake Superior Coastal Program. Lloyd K. Johnson Foundation and WSSD and a number of individual donors to support this project. And like I said, the timeline is, 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 is moving on this project uh, due to the, the, the virus, but we're really excited to, uh, to, to, show this new sh to show this new exhibit. Speaking of maintaining water quality, our largest animal habitat in the facility is the 45,000 gallon Isle Royal exhibit that's in the center of the aquarium. This is uh, an exhibit that um, showcases local uh, Lake Superior fish um, and, uh, and it's uh, about 25 uh, feet deep and 55 degrees so it's pretty cold as a diver that dives in there it, uh, it's definitely chilly and one of the sturgeon habitat you see swimming by here we've had in this uh, the facility since it opened um, 20 years ago, and in fact, this sturgeon that you're looking at is uh, 37 years old. So we know what year class uh, he was when when we collected him. So it was pretty exciting. Some of the fish uh, at the aquarium are from hatcheries. Um, some are from other facilities, and some are from the wild. We've worked with the DNR as well as local commercial and recreational anglers to collect fish for this exhibit. While our main focus is on Lake Superior, we want to ensure that people understand our connection to the rest of the world. Um, the area, this area of the aquarium, this is our uh, global connections, uh, demonstrates our connection to the world's oceans. What we do in our community affects the world. Live coral reefs, reef fish, and seahorses are featured here. Marine species are also residents in the Shipwrecks Alive exhibit. And a bit later, we will hear from one of our aquarists who raises animals for these habitats and grows their food too. Um, this video here, is of the Unsalted Seas Gallery. And the, this gallery used to be our classrooms and meeting space. We, resigned, we redes redesigned it in 2016 to feature a 9,000 gallon sturgeon touch pool um, with six different species of sturgeon from around the world. The gallery is also a home to a number of cichlid species. Um, you can see some people here touching the, at the touch pool and one of our touch pool ambassadors there. And this is, uh, Jeannie getting ready to to feed them. We have to actually target feed those species. So it's kind of a interesting work that they get to do. So each one is individually gets fed. And you can see some of those sturgeons swimming around here. 
and I think we'll have a Russian sturgeon swimming by right there. <laughs> and a beluga, that's the largest sturgeon species in the world right there. Um, so we also have cichlids here that you can see the, the gallery is home to a number of cichlids. This, tells, this gallery tells the story of large lakes around the world, of which Lake Superior is the largest by surface area. This, that, again, the, this touch pool is closed during the COVID-19 pandemic, but hopefully we'll have a chance to open it up here when, as uh, um, rules relax. Um, this here is the Aquatic Invaders exhibit. This showcases species that have negative impacts on local ecosystems. Um, we have read, this is, uh, you'll see here some goldfish and uh, as we pass by and, and we use these goldfish as a sort of as a teaching tool because seemingly innocuous species can actually be an invasive species if it was to be released in some of our ponds. We actually use the story of the rock pond up at UMD where they uh, had pulled out thousands of goldfish from uh, students uh, putting the goldfish in the pond. So it's, it was a really good teaching tool for us. This uh, gallery that we're going into now is, uh, is the Amazon gallery. Um, we've redesigned this exhibit a few times. It features animals from the Amazon River Basin in South America. And you can see these are discus here. These are, are probably one of my favorite fish. And not to try and not, everybody asks me what my favorite fish is. And actually it's smallmouth bass, but these are one of my favorite fish. Um, and then we we're, we try to showcase some different um, themes from uh, from the Amazon as well, and the flood season, and the um, and the dry season, and, and just but just some really cool species that we have. Probably the coolest of them, and is uh, at least in my humble opinion, is this guy here. This is Loki. He's the electric eel. Um, our staff typically does a watch us work with program with him, where they feed him and demonstrate the ways that we care for. Um, for animals. And one of the cool things with, with him is we have some uh, electrodes in the water. So he, when he impulses, uh, his electrical impulses go up, it lights go off and noises go off. So it's a, kind of a fun thing to watch when he's feeding. And this is the gift shop. So there are many ways to support the aquarium um, through tickets, our gift store, memberships, donations, and volunteering. Skunks and a possum there are probably the <laughs> super popular uh, project items. We also have an art gallery. This features regional artists and relevant themes. The next show is by Adam Swanson and we'll have some audio descriptions. Uh, check out the one website to learn more. It's a very cool gallery. This is behind the scenes where some of the uh, encounter animals are cared for. You can see it on the right. It is also where all of the diets are prepared. Well, coming up here, I guess. Um, so some of these are all our outreach and, and uh, encounter animals. And then as we turn the corner, that's going to be a minnow tank. <laughs> it's kind of new. And here we are, the kitchen. Um, we, uh, this is where all of our diets are prepared for in our animal kitchen. We also grow some of our food in the garden during the summer months. And um, we'll talk a little bit uh, more about that um, shortly. Uh, animals come to us from all over and we build habitats to support them. This is Dwight, a soft shell turtle that came from uh, Warner Nature Center. And that's uh, an animal care technician, Dana, holding on to him there. Um, and uh, there they are working on a turtle display. So this is part of our animal care team. We have terrestrial and uh, aquatic uh, teams. This is our quarantine area. Um, when animals arrive at the aquarium, they spend some time in this area. Uh, we need to ensure that, that the animal is healthy and um, also make sure that they eat what we give them. That's probably the most important uh, part of this is so that when they are put upstairs, we know that they, they won't get out competed by other animals. Um, and it's also where we can uh, treat animals if they're unwell and uh, care for animals off the exhibit floor. This space is adapted, uh, adaptable for freshwater, saltwater, and terrestrial animals. We have layers of biosecurity such as foot baths and dedicated um, to ensure that we do not bring anything in, in or out of this space. You can see these are some of those terrestrial habitats we have. This is uh, um, a, kind of a drawing of our life support. So if you can imagine we have, um, like I talked about the 45,000 gallons of water um, and fish, uh, a bunch of fish in there, you can uh, expect that uh, cleaning that up is, is pretty difficult. And as I like to say, fish live in their bathrooms. And so what you're seeing is a diagram of that water is uh, being pulled out and goes through a, a filtration that does um, physical filtration and, and um, 
Um, we also have chemical filtration and biological filtration. And the physical is in forms of sand filters that pull the particulates out of the water. And then um, we have ozone that we use that is a um, works sort of like chlorine in a pool. It's, it oxidizes the water, but its byproduct is oxygen, so it's safe for our fish. And then we have um, the biological aspect is we have a filter with nitrifying bacteria that take care of the, um, uh, the waste that they give off in uh, fish give off in the form of ammonia. So we're just giving you a little bit uh, another peek behind the scenes and hear from one of our aqua uh, aquarists. This is uh, going to be Miranda Wren. Um, this is a short clip of her explaining some of her work that she's doing in culturing and raising food, food and animals at the aquarium. Hi, my name's Miranda and I'm an aquarist here at the Great Lakes Aquarium and this is the culture room. So one of my jobs here is taking care of all of our live cultures, which most of are found in this room. And we culture both foods and display animals in here. The reason that we culture things is for sustainability. It's great to relieve pressure on the oceans from collecting certain animals when we can culture them here in house. Also for reducing our carbon footprint and our costs as a facility. Growing live foods that are nutritious for our collection um, here in house is a lot cheaper and better for the environment. One of our newest and healthiest foods here at the aquarium uh, are the Parvocalanus coca pods. So these coca pods are really tiny and the larvae of them are just 40 microns across. So think small baby fish. Um, being able to culture Parvocalanus pods in the aquarium industry has opened up so many doors to culturing fish that have never been cultured before. A lot of the marine ornamental fish that are presently often collected from the wild can actually be raised on this kind of coca pod. In addition, this coca pod is really helpful for feeding um, jellies, baby horseshoe crabs, and uh, other things as well. And the challenge with the Parvocalanus pods is it only eats live phytoplankton and it only eats specific species, uh, one of which is the isocrisis. So that is actually why we chose that species of phytoplankton to raise. These are baby dwarf seahorses. So dwarf seahorses are among the smaller species of seahorses. The adults are only about an inch long when full grown. Um, and they're, as you can see, quite tiny when they're born. So our dwarf seahorses are some of those animals that benefit from the carbocalanus pods as well as the rotifers as their first feeds. And we're lucky that our seahorses fairly consistently give us babies says their lifespan's only about a year to a year to a year and a half long. So well, I'm constantly raising these guys down here. Uh, if you look in the next tank, you can see some that are about two and a half months old. So these guys are almost prepared to go to exhibit. I like to move them up to exhibit when they hit three months of age, when they're stronger and more ready to be in a larger environment. Uh, who doesn't love seahorses? So that's, those are some cute little guys there. Um, heading into the summer, we are facing a number of unknowns. We will keep adapting, planning for the future, and doing good hard work together. Again, thank you for having us at the UMD alumni behind the scenes. Awesome. Well, thank you, Jay and Sarah, for providing us a tour in history of the Great Lakes Aquarium. It truly is amazing the impact that it has on our community. Um, we did ask ahead of time um, questions through the registration form. However, now is the time for our guests to submit questions using the Q&A section on the bottom of the webinar. So one of the questions that we had pre-submitted um, kind of follows along with where, where do the animals come from? So you did mention in the presentation that the animals come from all over. Um, could you please speak to where um, both native and non-native species come from? Yeah, I can. I can absolutely speak to that. When I uh, when I started the, at the facility, um, my I was the curator, and uh, so that was uh, the primary focus of my job was to uh, collecting all the species that we have. Um, but a good portion of the um, species that that we that we receive, specifically the local species, um, come from uh, the from Minnesota DNR and also Wisconsin DNR. Um, we also uh, um, we work with uh, w either through sampling is one of the ways uh, that I should say is we, we have a permit through the state of Minnesota 
um, that allows us to take um, um, animals in the wild. And uh, the DNR, when they go out, Minnesota DNR, when they go out sampling, they um, will come, they'll actually reach out to us and or vice versa and see what type of animals we're looking for. Like recently, we're trying to um, get some muskies for one of our St. Louis exhibits. And uh, so when they're out sampling, they can bring a few species in for us. Um, the, the main way that we receive like our salmonids, uh, which is the trout and salmon, um, that's through hatcheries. And so we uh, get a lot of uh, species that way. A lot of times we get them as juveniles in that quarantine area that you saw. Um, we'll bring uh, juvenile fish in and then raise them up um, to get them up to size to put on exhibit. And uh, the other way is we work uh, some of the non-native species. We work with, um, with uh, um, collectors, um, specifically like the marine fish. Um, we work with uh, professional collectors uh, in Florida and California. Um, and other aquariums is, a, is another way um, that we, uh, we are on a listserv um, nationally that um, we see species go up all the time that people are um, looking to trade or um, just looking for people to, to, to uh, receive and pay for shipping. And probably my favorite is uh, hook and line. <laughs> so we can go uh, fishing for, uh, for some species. Well, this next question asks about research. Um, what kind of research or environmental monitoring work are you collaborating on? And um, how do you maintain healthy habitats for the animals? Sure, um, I can answer this one. Uh, we, we, are not, um, we are not a research foundation or organization. Uh, some, some aquariums and zoos do have a really robust uh, research arm and are out in the field doing um, monitoring and uh, restoration work and collaborating uh, sort of on the ground. They have an entire team of people that does that. Um, we have done it in some smaller ways locally. Um, we have divers uh, that assist with a Northern Pike project and monitoring those fish and their their movement within the estuary. Um, we also have worked with UMD researchers on um, monitoring and um, studying goby control in the harbor. Uh, we've done a lot of evaluation of our own programming uh, for, and exhibits. So how do people learn in our spaces, in our programs? Um, through We've done some visitor studies. We're doing a lot of, um, we often are asked to write letters of support for uh, researchers who are looking to share the results of their work um, with the public and see our space as a great way to do that. So we've had a lot of uh, research being presented in unique ways for our audience or for the public, and we've collaborated on exhibit design to help do that. Um, so we do a lot of sharing out of results. And as far as environmental monitoring, we have some, some uh, standards that we as an organization have to meet as far as discharge water. Um, we do bring some water in from the harbor as part of our chilling system. Um, and so we have to monitor that uh, pretty closely for the EPA. Uh, we also have traditionally um, supported a program uh, called the Beach Sweep locally or Adopt a Beach, which is run throughout the Great Lakes and coordinating with the Ocean Conservancy on removing and recording marine debris um, in our waterways locally. Uh, so we do try to rally and connect and use sort of leverage our, our organizational strengths um, to support the work of, of others in our community. So really trying to make sure that we are lifting up and contributing, um, but not necessarily spearheading some of that research work. And the maintenance of healthy habitats for the animals, um, as Jay has mentioned, a lot goes into the life support systems here um, from monitoring all the different variables from pH to nitrate, nitrates and nitrates and ammonia and phosphates. And um, we do a lot of water chemistry. We actually have an internship focused specifically on water chemistry. Uh, so we have interns here who are using their chemistry degrees in unique ways to make healthy habitat for the animals. Um, we also do a lot of collaborative training work with the animals. So part of being healthy is participating in care and doing that in a way that's supportive of uh, the animals' bodies, but also minds and uh, making sure that we build healthy relationships and uh, are able to make changes to habitats. They're flexible. 
um, to adapt to the needs of the particular animals in our care. Is there anything, Jay, you want to mention, you want to add to the healthy habitats piece or? Uh, yeah, the only other piece in, uh, is also the mechanical work of, of the staff. A good portion of, of it is, is um, uh, you know, cleaning on exhibits and, and, and getting in there. We saw a couple of the, of the shots in the video of, of staff um, uh, doing maintenance. And so we, we, we have to, you know, maintain these, these water filtration systems, but then also cleaning up the habitats as well. And so um, it's a, you know, prop probably the most uh, important part of the animal's health is ensuring that they have a healthy habitat. And, and as Sarah said too, the training is really big is, is that uh, even training for fish. I, I, uh, uh, when I started in my, in this field 25 years ago, um, training fish was not something that was regularly talked about, but as of recent times, we actually have trained our sharks and our stingrays to go to certain spots to feed and, and to go to targets and to help with, um, some of the uh, um, uh, medical uh, work that we do is that can be really stressful on animals. And so having a target where they have uh, sort of a happy place that they go to to get food. And then, um, so like the sharks, they'll go to this, they'll go inside of a sling to eat. Um, they'll, they'll go to the target. And then uh, um, when we need to pull the, the shark out to wear or do some blood draws, then, then it's not as stressful. Well, we actually have some live questions coming in here that um, you might like to answer. One of them asks, what do your turtles eat? <laughs> um, uh, vegetables and um, they eat uh, lettuce and they eat, um, uh, they'll eat a lot of um, like wax worms type or mealworms and things like that. Actually, they have a, a pretty varied diet. It's interesting to, 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 um, the question about turtles is interesting. And just in general, um, when you saw that picture of our, uh, of our kitchen, the amount of food that's in there the, and the, the different types is, is pretty impressive. Um, I always, I always uh, love to do tours through there and talk about that because of we have the, obviously the seafood that, um, that a good portion of our fish eat. But then we also, uh, as we mentioned, have a garden that we grow. We have um, 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 various different vegetables and fruits that a lot of our animals get. We have some live foods we'll, like crickets and uh, mealworms. And, um, and then and as you saw Miranda, when she showed you the culture room, just those, that, uh, those live feeds that we're feeding out, um, all of that is, 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 is really important to the, to the animal's health. And it's, it's like the maintenance is important and the, and the water quality is important. And the diet is 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 equally as important. Um, I've had uh, times where I we've had fish health issues in, in in my experience, and you know you you instantly would go to like a, like what's the what's like a pathogen that's actually causing the problem. And, and a lot of times I find it's related to water quality. Or it's related to their diet. Nice. Sorry to go on a tangent there, but to <laughs> for but for turtles, yeah, they eat vegetables and mealworms. Perfect. It looks like we have time for about one more question. And um, we do have one. Uh, someone's wondering, how can people get involved with the aquarium and support? Sure, there are a number of ways um, to be involved. Uh, we really try to collaborate across the board. We've obviously collaborated with UMD quite a bit on all kinds of different projects. Um, and again, just try to leverage expertise and spaces and um, we are always looking for volunteers and uh, financial support. Um, we are a nonprofit and so all of the funds that we receive go back into the work that we're doing for the community and for the lake and um, so supporting us through donations online or through various appeals or events. We have a, an annual fundraiser called Aqua Affair that will happen in the fall um, that folks can look for announcements about uh, we are always interested in sharing out employment opportunities too so passing on um, opportunities you might that might come through even UMD channels uh, just sharing those with your communities to really make sure that we are representing our community well uh, do you want to mention any other ways folks can support Jay I, you know, uh, volunteering, I don't know if you, yep. if you mentioned that or not, um, is, is one of the ways, um, you know, we, we always are, are taking in um, 
uh, volunteers. Um, yeah, that's in some of the, there's, you know, there's, there's uh, um, a lot of ways that, that, that we, we, we look to um, ideas too. And so if there's, a, you know, in, anything that, uh, that people are interested in, they can always sort of reach out to us. Perfect. And we know that there are lots of other questions um, asked today. Um, so feel free on the next slide here, uh, the aquarium and our website are listed. So feel free to reach out um, with your questions and either the aquarium or our office will, will get back to you with an answer. Um, so once again, thank you so much to our host, Jay and Sarah, for taking the time to share with us the exclusive look of the Great Lakes Aquarium. Um, it's definitely exciting that they're reopening today and we encourage you all to stop in for a visit to see the exhibits for yourself. Additionally, please keep an eye out for our upcoming alumni and friends online learning sessions. Um, our next programs feature a tour of the Duluth Harbor and of UMD's very own Bagley Nature Center. So again, a big thanks to Jay and Sarah, and we hope that you will join us again for future online events. Thanks and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks for having us.